Okay, so thank you, for, Professor, for agreeing to do this interview with us. And it's really an honor that you're here with us uh, celebrating Africa Day uh, and promoting African unity and excellence. Uh, I really appreciate that. And uh, happy Africa Day to everyone. Uh, some of you might know Professor Amsege. He is one of the uh, top leading science in the field of uh, paleoanthropology and anthropology in general. He has made uh, numerous discoveries that redefine the field that we are going to discuss more about it later. But to kick off the, the interview, I'm just going to start with a cliche question. Who is uh, Professor Zasan Al Alam Saged and what does he do at the University of Chicago? Thank you, Caleb. Let me echo what you said and say also, happy Africa Day. Much needed for Africa, a continent that has so much to offer that often finds itself in difficulties. So happy Africa Day, everyone. Yeah, my name is Zarai Alam Saged. I am a professor of anthropology at the University of Chicago. And what I do is simple. I look for the origins of humanity, trying to find the traces that unite all of us, meaning the 7 billion people. And when you do that, you see that indeed Africa is the crucible, the cradle of mankind, where every single human being today, whether it's person is from Asia, America, Africa, or you name it, can trace their ancestry back to Africa, which starts 7 million years ago. And if you speak specifically about our species, Homo sapiens, that goes back to 300,000 years ago. So Africa has this uniting factor that brings all humanity together. And I hope one day Africans will also be united and work together. I think that introduces me in short. Yeah, Thank you. That's perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe you can tell us more about your upbringing. I know uh, you were born in Aksum, which is one of the earliest civilizations in the world, and it's one of the most visited cities in Ethiopia. Uh, has that in any way uh, played any role for you uh, to become a curious person or become a scientist? You could also uh, give us a short summary of your journey as a paleoanthropologist. Yes, thank you. Yes, I was born, as you said, uh, in Aksum, uh, which is in the northern part of Ethiopia. And Aksum dates back to uh, the civilization, of course, dates back to uh, uh, the beginnings of the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, basically 100, 100 AD, uh, 100 BC. Uh, it was one of uh, the uh, prominent empires at its height. Uh, comparable to the then Persia, uh, India, and China, and Rome civilization. So has uh, my upbringing in Axum uh, somehow affected the paleoanthropologist that I am today? Perhaps, but really what drove me to this field of research is interest in scientific curiosity, interest in inquiry, interest in the very question, what makes us human? So yes, uh, the upbringing may have had something to do, but I was not aware until much older, which is later when I graduated as a geologist that I was interested in paleoanthropology. So once I graduated from uh, Addis Ababa University, this is back in 1990, 1991, uh, I studied in Paris uh, at the University of Sorbonne, where I did my PhD and my master's. And after that, I have served at the Arizona State University uh, as a postdoc and then a senior scientist at the Max Planck Institute in Germany and then in California, and now a professor at the University of Chicago. While doing all of that, I have made uh, some of the most prominent discoveries, which includes the discovery of Salam and the evidence for the earliest use of stone tools that also go back to Africa. So when you put all that together, my journey as a paleoanthropologist has been a, a fun journey, which also contributed to really putting Africa uh, on the map uh, as a place where, indeed, we all come from that beautiful continent. Excellent. Yeah, you have mentioned uh, some of your discoveries, uh, and you are a uh, world-renowned paleoanthropologist for uh, those uh, numerous discoveries, but can you maybe tell us more about, uh, obviously, the Salam, the discovery of Salam, which is the earliest and most complete uh, human ancestor to be ever found? And also, uh, as you mentioned, the uh, 
uh, evidence of the all uh, the all the oldest evidence of stone tool use and meat eating among the Australopithecus afarensis species. And maybe you can add on that how those discoveries helps us uh, in understanding the pre-human and human evolution in general. Thank you, Caleb. Those are very good questions indeed, and mean a lot to me. So the first one, the discovery of Salam, uh, is a discovery of a skeleton, uh, a skeleton which actually was published on the cover page of uh, Nature, as you can see it's behind me, which tells you already what the significance uh, is. Uh, and that is when we paleoanthropologists go out there to make uh, discoveries and do research, and I've been in this business for now 25 years, what we are asking is um, mainly uh, questions that pertain to, number one, when did we humans uh, start to walk on two legs to begin with? And second is, when did we start to use tools uh, that today we take for granted? Three, when did we acquire this big and complex brain in our evolutionary history? And number four is, when did we become the symbolic species, this very curious species that only not cares about what it eats and what it drinks, but also wants to know where it came from? If you have a cat or a dog and you'd ask them if they're really curious where they come from, I would argue that it's unlikely that they would wonder about that question. So these key unique human attributes are what we are looking after. So during my uh, research, therefore, I led uh, in 1999 what was then the first uh, Ethiopian-led uh, paleoanthropological research project to the site of Tikika. This is in the Afar region, and made a discovery uh, of the skeleton, which is more complete than the famous Lucy. You may know Lucy is. Uh, one of the most celebrated fossils in human ancestry. It dates back to over 3 million years ago. And Salam is 150,000 older than Lucy, even though she died at the age of three. So when you then have a complete skeleton, which is a skeleton which is 60% complete and belongs to a child, it gives you a unique window to look at what is called childhood, meaning when did humans start to care as much as we do for infants, for their children? Because if you look at other animals, take the antelopes in the Serengeti Park, for example, they are born and then they run away because they have to cope up with their environment. What happens in humans is unique dependence of children, infants, on their parents. And during that dependence is when you learn languages when you acquire other human skills that will later allow you to flourish as an individual. And this dependence actually is now even exaggerated in humans because children stay, of course, at the, at the, for breastfeeding first to go to school and sometimes even after, after college. Uh, so this unique behavior of humans uh, is something that we, were, we did not have much information about. And based on the skeleton of Salam, we were able to determine the origin of this unique human attribute, which dates back now to 3.3 million years ago. So this complex issues of human behavior and where and when they appeared is what we would like to answer. And Salam has helped us to answer those questions. That's number one. And number two, uh, because most of the fossils that we find are fragmentary, a uh, piece of a leg or a cranium or a hand or what have you. The skeleton of Salam, as you can see it on that screen, is complete. And you can see the face and really say, well, okay, three million years ago, children that belong to the human lineage looked like them. So it's a combination of the completeness, but also the ability to talk about complex human behavior and their origins that makes the discovery of Salam unique. And we've learned a great deal about that. Not only was she published on the cover page of Nature, was published on the cover page of the National Geographic and the scientific journal Science. So that gives you an idea of the significance of this discovery. 
The second find is also equally important, and that relates to when did in humans, and when I say humans, I'm talking about the 7 billion individuals, whether you're from Africa, Asia, America, Europe, you name it. When did we start to use stone tools for the first time? So today, you know, we're using Zoom and we have iPhones and we have all this digital uh, world and a rocket, you name it. What many people don't realize is, in fact, what is more complex, what is more difficult is not from, to transition from the iPhone 1 to iPhone 2 to iPhone 3, iPhone 10, but to really be the first person to pick up that rock, shape it with the anticipation of using it for some purposes, maybe consuming meat, which is calorie rich, which is good for your brain. So when we look at that, therefore, it's again my team, the Dikika Research Project, that discovered the evidence for the first use of stone tools to carve meat of the bone. And once you have that primitive stone tool that was shaped intentionally by early human ancestors in Africa, then that would launch the evolution of all the technologies that we know today that also are allowing us to go not only to different parts of the earth, but even beyond to the moon and sometimes to Mars using our tools. So it's a combination of therefore those discoveries that make my work significant and also led to my being nominated, as you may have heard, to the, uh, uh, the American uh, you know, uh, Association of uh, Science, Association for Advancement of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and recently the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. So the significance of what we do as paleontologists is not just a matter of going out there and find the bones and or put them in the museums. Even the Vatican, meaning even the Pope, knows the significance of what we do. And Africa will go forward only if we were to stick to the facts, truth, and science. Yeah, perfect. Uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, that you have been appointed by the Pope uh, to be a member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. And prior to that, you are also a member of the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, First of all, huge congratulations. Uh, Thank you. What does it mean to be a member of such uh, elite scientific societies? And what does it take to be uh, a member? And what uh, surprised me is that the Pope, which, whom I assume believes in Christianism, is, is uh, appointing or appointing a scientist, a scientist working on human evolution. How does both go together? And what can we learn as, an, as Africans or like as Africa in general? Yeah, so I would say that the way forward for Africa is to employ and deploy a scientific approach to what we do, that's number one. Number two, why was I uh, elected to be a member of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, the American Academy of uh, Arts and Sciences, and also recently the Pontifical Academy of Sciences? The key word in all of those is the word science. You see, in the West, they do, they respect, and they worship, I would say, science, because it has transformed their lifestyle and their lives. Clearly, when you look at life expectancy, when you look at the quality of life, you only look at uh, the advancements uh, they have made, it's simply mind Blowing. And note that Africa had this already. As you mentioned, the Aksumite Empire had some of the most sophisticated engineers and scientists. Go to Timbuktu, they had universities in the 13th, 14th century. Go to the Great Zimbabwe, and you continue. Africa is not new to science. It's just that it has forgotten it. That's what we need to revive. So you ask me why? Well, first off, when you are elected to be the member of these academies and associations, you don't know how and who nominates you. The only thing I know is that I have done my work to the extent that I can, to the best of my abilities, and people are watching, and therefore the nomination process is confidential. All I know was that I got the letter, I was nominated, and I'm going to see, for example, the Pope in September 9 or 8. 
to get the insignia saying that I'm a member of the academy. So I think to be a member, all you need to do is to excel in what you do. Whatever it is that you do, it doesn't matter. You can be an engineer, you could be a chemist, a doctor, you could be a historian, you could be an anthropologist or a human evolutionist like myself. The key is to excel in what you do because you will be vetted by your peers, by your colleagues. That's number one. And number two is to go sometimes beyond even the scientific realm and try to make a difference about people's lives on their day-to-day life. And one thing that I like doing, for example, is I like explaining human evolution to people. I like explaining paleoanthropology to the lay person, be it uh, through my TED Talk or TV shows or by writing popular articles. So t- for, for one to be elected and be a member of those institutions, they will have to demonstrate excellence, of course, in what they do, but also relevance to the public at large at the same time. Uh, specific to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, I will admit I was very surprised when I got the letter because they only have 80 members and it's uh, uh, for life. And uh, some of the members in the past have been like uh, uh, famous scientists like, uh, uh, you know, Hawkins uh, when they give a lecture uh, and almost all of the 80 people are scientists. Some of many of them Nobel Peace Laureate, actually, the person who was nominated with me is a uh, Nobel Peace, uh, 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 no, uh, Nobel Laureate in, uh, in, in, in medicine. So uh, the, 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 the academy is, of course, uh, part of the Vatican. But remember, the Vatican is not just a church. It's like, it's like a country. It has its own army. It has its own banks. It has, you know, everything. So the the Pontifical Academy of Science elects its members solely based on their scientific excellence. They don't ask for what religion you are, which country you come from, what language you speak, they don't care. But they look at whether what you've done is indeed something great for science, but also relevant to humanity. And the Vatican Church actually acknowledges the existence and the fact that evolution is a fact. It was John Paul II, who was uh, before Benedict, who was before Francis, who actually said, this is a fact. We can't close our God-given eyes to something that is out there. So they, they accept it. The question would be then, how do you, how do you explain that? Uh, maybe there are differences uh, in terms of how we explain uh, what we see. But the fact that we see evolution happening is not something that the Vatican Church denies. They accept it, and that's why uh, I'm there. I'm actually the second person in this field, the other person being a French scientist. So uh, the answer would have to come from them. But when I was elected and nominated and I uh, presented my work, I presented what I'm telling you. I work on human evolution. Uh, I work on how we humans evolved in Africa and then populated the rest of the planet. And the, the church, especially the uh, Pontifical Academy of Science, does not have any problems with that. In fact, I was there in 2012 to give a lecture for three days. And I stayed in the building for three days giving lectures to bishops and uh, nuns and uh, people who occupy that building. So I think what the Vatican or the, the Vatican Church is trying to do is to accept the things that they cannot deny. They understand the importance of science. They understand the significance of science. So if they are going to stay uh, uh, relevant, then there is no way that they can say no to science because everything that they do every day is now both predicated but also dependent on what are the outputs of the scientific endeavor. Brilliant. Thank you for sharing that, Dan. Uh, so uh, in our last conversation, uh, which, by the way, will be out soon, so I encourage everyone uh, to, to check our website in a few days. I have learned uh, a lot personally, so I think you also do. So uh, coming back to my question, I learned that the discovery of Salam, for instance, took more than 12 years, 12 years of countless challenges. 
And I was just wondering if you ever felt giving up during the process. And if so, what motivated you to keep going? Thank you, Caleb. So you, you, you mentioned one key word, that was process. You see, what many people get confused uh, about is uh, that science is not about the eureka moment. Science is a process. So when someone engages in a scientific endeavor, unless they enjoy the process, they will be very, very, very bored and tired. So therefore, the first thing for a scientist is to accept the fact that science is a process. It takes time, patience, and resources. So when the discovery was made in 2000, yes, you're right, it took 12 years to carefully extract the information from the skeleton and publish a series of papers on some of the most prestigious journals, including Nature and, and Science, which you, I know you're a scientist, so you understand what, what, that, what, what, that, what that means. Okay. That, that, so that's number one. So number two, the reason why I don't give up is because I will tell you honestly that I don't, I don't, I don't know what else to do with life. This is my passion. Uh, this is something that I love, and I really feel privileged to do what I'm doing. Because what I do is, of course, good for me because I like it. Yes, it gives me a job that's good too. But then to be the person and the first person to be out there in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the desert, and find the evidence that connects to, huma to humanity, that connects that ancient ancestor to all the 7 billion people. In many ways, you're serving as an ambassador for the billions of people and going out there greeting our ancestors. The deep sense of happiness and excitement that one feels when, uh, when someone like me is involved in this business of looking for our origins is priceless. And therefore, I really have little time to give up or to be tired of what I'm doing. You can give me another 100 years if possible. I would do it again. That's very interesting. <laughs> uh, let's talk more about Africa now. Uh, so it is a fact that Africa provides so many pieces to the puzzle of the human evolution. Yet we don't see that many African scientists in the field. Uh, what do you think are uh, the barriers for an African to pursue a career or uh, studies in, in the field, like as a, as a top uh, African scientist in the field? How do you think someone could break those barriers? Yeah, so I think the key word is inspiration. You see, uh, growing up, uh, I did not have the type of inspiration that one can find, the average African can find in me and you today. In many ways, uh, the route that I took, uh, maybe you probably had a better route, the route I took is a, uh, random one, arbitrary one. I just followed opportunities until I settled with the passion that I was describing earlier. So what we need in Africa is first, an inspiration. And especially in the field of our origins, and our origins doesn't necessarily have to be about human evolution. It could also be the origin of African history, the origins of African civilization. How many kids in Africa know about Timbuktu? How many kids know about the Great Zimbabwe? Would a Ghanaian or a Zimbabwean kid know about Aksum? How much? Would a Kenyan or an Ethiopian know about Great Zimbabwe? No, they are not given our textbook. So what we need is inspiration. I'm not talking about education, inspiration. Education is, of course, a bottom line, but inspiration. So that is one of the most important things that we need in Africa today. Yes, when we learn at school about science, we're going to learn about Albert Einstein, Newton, et cetera, et cetera. But would African kids recognize themselves, identify themselves in those scientists? Yes, they should because they are scientists. But 
how different would it be if someone who looks like Nkrumah was to be a scientist? Someone who looks like Haile Selassie was to be a scientist. Someone who looks like, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, Kagame would be a scientist. That would make a big difference. But then sending our kids to school is not enough. We should also give them the opportunity to be curious, to uh, unbound and then to open the horizons of thinking for them. Uh, listen, uh, we have many traditions, religions, et cetera, et cetera, and that's just perfectly fine. But when people sometimes argue with me about human evolution in Africa, I tell them if they want to be more Christian than the Pope, well, they can try it. The Pope has 1.3 billion under, him, under his auspices. And I tell them if they want to understand what I'm doing, they don't need to talk to me. They can talk to the Pope. So we need imaginations like that in Africa where, yes, we maintain our traditions. I love my tradition. We, our cultures, yes. But there are things that we need to work out. There are things that we don't need. Our kids are not competing with the village next door now. Yes. 50 years ago, an African kid will compete with an African kid. Maybe not far from the village. Now, no, he or she is competing with a kid who is in Japan, who is in Arizona, or in Peking. So the challenges before us are daunting, and they can only address if we were to follow a scientific path while maintaining our good traditions and culture. So to answer your question, what we need is inspiration, in addition to good education, of course. Perfect. That's very interesting and an eye opening. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, what are uh, you have already discussed some of your thoughts on Africa? Uh, specifically, I want to know uh, that uh, Africa is so rich, obviously, but it's uh, almost forty percent of its population lives under the poverty line. Uh, yet, uh, and Africa is also the dawn of humanity, as you say. In its home to some of the world's earliest civilizations in the world, yet we are still fighting for our basic human rights. Why is that we are not uh, where we are supposed to be, given that we were the first in, in, in many aspects, in many respects? Uh, yeah. How, how can we solve those paradoxes? I completely agree with your characterization of the facts on ground. Yes we find ourselves in a predicament that no other continent is facing. Poverty, war, famine, disease, you name it. Given that, we can agree that Africa has great facts. The number one, it's huge. And size matters if used, used, if used properly. Second, it's rich, as you said, has untapped resources, but it's huge and rich while people are starving, as you were saying. Africa is also very diverse. And this actually, we owe it to the fact that Africa is the origin of humanity. When you are the origin, you become diverse and it's something that we should celebrate. But one should ask, yes, we are huge, rich, diverse, but how come even though we are the origin of humanity, we are not the destination of humanity. You know, people think that the tourism in Africa is working. It's not working. What you see in Africa are some adventure tourists coming visit. Most people are going to Europe, Asia, and other places. So why is that happening? Africa is not only huge, rich, and diverse, it's also very young. Most of its people are as you were saying, young people. There is a lot of energy there to be tapped into. It's also full of talent. Not just raw material that Africa has, it also has raw brains that are ready to be used. So the question then is, how do we do that? What is the way forward? The way forward? I would point to four things. Number one, 
is science. For two, an institutions. But three, coming together. And more importantly, number four, we need an African positive attitude towards Africa. Let me maybe explain a little bit. When I say science, it is only when we have a scientific approach to the world outlook, when we have a scientific curiosity, a scientific behavior, that we can make relevance of the education that our kids are getting. Education without that scientific behavior outlook and curiosity is not going to take us far. What you become is you become a good student. You, do, you don't become a good scientist. And as I said earlier, research and science universities are not new to Africa. Go to Timbuktu, Great Zimbabwe, and the Aksumite Empire. The second one is we need institutions because without strong institutions, we cannot have the scientific process functioning. And those institutions must be based on our humanistic values, peace, and harmony. I sometimes wonder what the AU is doing. It's been now 59 years. But as you know, there are fightings next door. What is the AU doing to address these giant issues? Therefore, institutions, strong and powerful institutions are needed. We also need to come together as people, Africans. You see, when I say we need an African positive attitude towards Africa, I sometimes ask the question, how often would a Kenyan visit Ethiopia or a Ghanaian visit Gabon or a South African visit Zimbabwe before they go to Thailand or the US or Japan? How do we really treat each other? You know, complaining about others is really enough. We have complained enough now. It's not the solution. What we need is to come together and really have a positive attitude towards ourselves. So as we celebrate Africa Day, it is through science, strong institutions, and positive African attitude towards our own, towards Africa. It's through this that we can pull out ourselves and our people from poverty and the economic and political morass that we find ourselves and look forward and stand upright as humans did it six million years ago in Africa. They stood upright. We need to stand upright by coming together scientifically. Thank you. That's, that's very interesting. And I personally love the positive African attitude towards Africa. And that's essentially what we are trying to do in the Africa I know as well, so I'm happy you mentioned that. Uh, maybe if you have any piece of advice for the uh, African youth, as you said, Africa is the youngest continent on earth. Uh, so specifically, if you have any advice to the youth or any uh, message you'd like uh, to share. I think the message revolves at, about, around what I just said. That is, unless we, again, inspire the youth, unless the youth is ready to get inspired. An inspiration is not necessarily going online and finding what the latest type of gadget or iPhone is. An inspiration is in our backyards also. The plants and the animals that are roaming the landscapes of Africa are the sources of an inspiration. African scientists like myself must strive to inspire to inspire African kids. And the fact that we come together does not mean saying no to the other. Coming together is critical, but also remember that the world is now one. As I was saying earlier, an African kid is not anymore competing with the African kid in the next village. The African kid is competing with those who are in Japan, in America, in Europe, and all of them, which, whether you come from Europe, Asia, Africa, you have the same brain size, scientifically speaking. I can, I can speak to that because that is my specialty. We are all the same. Our genes say that we have 99.9% .9 the same. So it's only the environment. It's only the context 
that needs to be altered through science, institutions, and inspiration. If we can do that, then I can guarantee you that before we know it, Africa will be where it should be. And that is equal to other continents. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to be with us today and share your wisdom. Uh, have a good day. Thank you so much. Happy Africa Day. Thank you, Kalav. I appreciate the things that you do. Keep it up. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Aji, uh, we can move on to the next session. Um, actually, the audience was so excited about the interview that there were uh, two. Uh, 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 Aji, do you have the questions? Or yes, the first one is by by Kadudal. Uh, his real name is Mamadou. He says, we are now realizing that the that most of the big companies in the U.S. are interested in Africa. Google is being is opening their labs in Africa, and, and so are others. My questions are, one, what should African young leaders do in order to avoid these companies to take control of our continent? And two, how would you convince young African tech engineers working in the U.S. and other countries to go back to Africa and work for their continent? Okay, so two questions. Google and are coming. How do we stop them from taking over Africa? And second, how do we encourage Africans themselves to, take, to be in charge? The answer is simple. As I said earlier, so long as we employ scientific and logical methods to our endeavors, then the solution will be found in that process. Let me explain. If Google comes to Kenya or Ghana and they want to open their plants there, the question for us is not whether they are coming or going. The question should be, what is in the interest of Africa for Google to come and open their offices in Africa? It could be good, it could be bad. The way we decide should be in an objective manner, whereby the finances need to make sense. It should not harm the ecology. It should give opportunities to the locals. And ultimately, it should not, it should not take away resources in manners that are not consistent with what Africans are interested in. So it's not a matter of saying, come or don't come. We should go out of that. that. That's not how business works. That's not how science works. We should have a logical and scientific approach to our decisions. Is it good for our finances, ecology, cultures, et cetera? And the second question is, how do we encourage Africans to be in charge? Again, is that same process. When someone comes, knock at your door, and in, uh, you know, in our tradition in Africa, it's normal to go to your neighbor and ask for salt or fire. The question is, what do you want? Fire or salt? Do you have fire, salt, yes or no? If not, then how do you acquire that? If you do, what is the best way of sharing it with others? Such that both parties can benefit in the situation is a win-win situation. I think the many, many ways, uh, the, the way we handle business in Africa, in my humble view, is either a lose-win a lose -win situation or a lose-lose situation. What we need is to remember that whether it's Google, whether it's America, Japan, China, they are doing business because it's good for them. It's incumbent upon us to convert those opportunities and make sure that it's good for them, but also good for us. Thank you. Yes, that's very important. Thanks so much. There is another question from Jonathan. Uh, Professor al uh, is there anything in your background training uh, before you went to college and graduate school that you think prepared you well to do the research that you're doing right now? Not something specific about your field of study, but rather something general in the way that you studied or any work ethics. I know, for example, that many people in my home country 
that go to in foreign countries have a good background in math and physics. Hence, when they go in foreign countries, they excel in engineering because they have been trained on that for years before leaving the continent, for example. Do you think that you were ready to engage with difficult questions because of your training? The answer is no, I was not ready. Because growing up in, I, in Ethiopia, the, the system, the educational system, is what you may know in many parts of Africa. It's not really going to prepare you for a specific training. Yes, maybe some will go to medicine and engineering, but that's it. That's where it stops. After that, it is uh, shooting in the dark. So uh, in terms of the high school I went to, I really went to a very basic uh, Ethiopian high school, uh, which you can imagine. I did not go to a fancy paid school. Second, when I graduated from college as a geologist, I was actually assigned to work at the National Museum of Ethiopia via lottery. It was just you draw a uh, chip and then you go in. So uh, I will tell you, the person that I have become, the scientist that I have become, I can tell you that I made it myself. So for example, scholarship came from France for someone to study to do their PhD. Guess what? Up until that day, I had not expressed a single word of French. But guess what? I went to France at the age of 23 and then wrote my PhD dissertation in French after studying French for nine months. And uh, so what we had uh, growing up and probably the case for most African kids now is it's a matter of grabbing the opportunity that presents itself. Yes, we cannot wait until everything is smooth and well, whereby people will choose, okay, this is what I need, this is what I want. I did not have that opportunity, and it's very likely that the African kid today will not have that opportunity. And that's why inspiration is very, very, very important. And thanks to the digital media today, it has been somehow uh, uh, been made easier to inspire, to communicate to talk to young kids through this all digital media. So yes, was I prepared to do what I do? No. Uh, did I have easy way to achieve that? No. But did I take opportunities that present themselves, including picking up a language that I had never had exposure to at the age of 22 and write my dissertation in French? Yes. So uh, I, I think what we need in Africa is a combination of seizing the opportunity, but also an aspiration. And therefore, young people like you, you know, uh, Aji and Caleb, whenever you travel, travel back, make sure that you go to at least one high school or one elementary school and just give a lecture about your work. It could be biochemistry, it could be engineering, it could be history, you name it, it doesn't matter. Just tell them that it is doable. The fact that they look at your face and you look like themselves and that that will give them an opportunity to say, yes, it is possible. Uh, remember, if you were to Google the word scientists, just do it when you're done working. You'll see faces. You will not find someone who looks like you. And those kids are Googling now on the, the corners of Ghana and Zambia. So we, they need to see people like yourselves, like myself, who actually are bona fide scientists. And they will make it. They will have an easier way compared to what we had. Thank you so much, Professor. Yes, inspiring the next generation is very important, and that's one of the pillars in Thai. Uh, we have articles, we write articles about people, uh, Africans who have achieved a lot. And check out our website. Thank you, Professor, for joining us again. Uh, have a good day. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye. Yes, bye-bye. Thank you.